everybody. Welcome to the Library Makerspace virtual tour series. Today we're going to be meeting with Christian Sheehy. He joined Xavier University as a digital initiatives librarian in 2015 and has worked in public libraries uh, for the last 10 years. So he um, has a BA in English from Northern Kentucky University and an MLIS from Drexel in Philadelphia. He really likes uh, scribbling with fountain pens and sipping gunpowder green tea. I know that gunpowder green tea is one of my favorites. Um, if you're not familiar, I hope you'll all enjoy some and try some um, to get to know us a little bit better. Uh, Let's see, Christian's going to share with us his makerspace, the makerspace that he works in at Xavier University. And he's gonna get started by sharing with us kind of an overview of the space, and then we'll ask a bunch of questions at the end. So uh, Christian, go ahead and show us around and introduce us to your space. Very good, thanks for having me. I will try not to make you dizzy as I move about space. Okay, so we're in the makerspace. We've been, um, we're on the first floor of the McDonald Library on Xavier's campus. We've been open almost two years now, two years next month. So we've had a good run. And I have some statistics I'll share. Uh, I like, you know how, how well we like numbers. Uh, so we'll share those with you. But uh, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to walk around the room and hopefully I can move my head in such a way that you can see what's going on. I'll give you a quick overview and then I'll go step by step. This is making me dizzy. Uh, so this is, here's the makerspace. I'll give you, I'll get a little closer as we go, but uh, this was the old uh, circulation desk that uh, was moved to the third floor, which when you say that to people who are on campus, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Why would you put circulation on the third floor? We had a new building that was built about a decade ago uh, that has a entry level, and that became like the official entrance to the library. So our entrance is on three instead of one. So um, it reduced the number of people who were checking out things down here. So we repurposed the space for this. So that's where we got the space. Okay, I'll try to. So in this corner, <laughs> we have a variety of high tech and low tech things. We, we try to uh, drive a lot of the purchases that we make on uh, student requests and uh, the kinds of things that they need for their, their classes and their projects, or even just the fun stuff that they want to do. So we do have items that can be checked out. I think I got it in the shot there. Uh, we have drones, we have Raspberry Pis, we have a variety of electronics and robotics that can be checked out. Let's see, I'll see here. What else can I show you? These are board games. We have a lot of open table space, so we do uh, provide a variety of board games that students can just use. And, and they're honor resources, so students leave the building with them, they take them to their dorm, they bring them back, usually. So <laughs> we do have those. Legos are big. I think I got Legos in there. Uh, we got the Mindstorms, just buckets of plain Legos too, because who doesn't like Legos? Uh, let's see, duct tape, paint, a variety of things. Um, I'll give you a quick lesson on storage that we learned pretty quickly. So libraries, you know how we never have enough money for anything, right? You've, you've encountered this. <laughs> so when we first uh, open the space, we look for furniture, like in the basement and weird buildings around campus. So we found these old filing cabinets that had a lot of storage room, just these big black filing cabinets. You open the drawer, put all the stuff in there, we label the front. And it was so monstrous and intimidating that no one ever used any of our stuff because you couldn't see anything. So we got these open shelves now, so you can quickly see what's on the shelf. We label what we have to, but you can still walk over and grab what you need. Uh, similarly, we have these, I'll try not to make you dizzy, these rolling carts. Uh, this was a great investment. These carts are like $30. They're plastic, but they do hold things pretty well. We keep a lot of our crafty kinds of things in here, paints and popsicle sticks and pipe cleaners. We do have some calligraphy tools, bookmaking supplies. Glue, glue gun, Sharpies, that kind of thing. Feeling good so far. Okay. Uh, 
on. Christian, can I ask a, can I interrupt and ask a quick question? Can Absolutely. you, are, you've mentioned bookmaking and calligraphers a bunch of times so far, and I'm just curious, how big of, is that like a, um, is there a major for that? Is that something that Xavier focuses on in terms of like having, I mean, do you have a book arts program, I guess is what I'm wondering at the university? It's, it's not specifically a book arts program, but we do have a lot of art students who are into that. And the very first class we hosted here, it was, it was an English class, not an art class, but the first makerspace class was this English class and their project was to make books. And that made me very happy because even though we are a makerspace, we're all high tech, we're still part of the library. So that was, I mentioned that all the time. <laughs> it made me very happy. That's awesome. Now, this next bit is not the most exciting, so I'll get this part out of the way quickly. We do have student workstations, so they can sign in and uh, you know, check their email or whatever it is they need to do here. Uh, and it will attach to that. There are some interesting things over here. Uh, we do have a vinyl cutter and uh, a 3D scanner, and we can talk about 3D scanning and how clunky it is if you want to get into that later. <laughs> have any of you tried 3D scanning? Was it terrible? Yeah, uh, I've worked with a few different devices. One of them we have here is called, I think it's a Fuse 3D scanner. It is like the worst tool. And we actually have, I have a class I work with where they do 3D scanned bus, but they usually use cameras and then import it into uh, whatever it is, whatever Autodesk software is, they keep changing the name, Recap. And Prior to that, we had a little 3D scanner at my previous space uh, as a laser scanner, and that was, eh, it worked decently. I forget what the brand was, but yes, I've had a lot of problems with the current scanner. It's very, it's very hit or miss for sure. Yeah. We typically end up with giant blobs when we do that scanning. Right, exactly. that, that was our issue too. And if the lighting's not perfect, or if you, if you jostle it just a little bit, you just get this clump of stuff that's hard to man, uh, mess with. All right, I'm gonna turn around, you ready? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is Julian. He's a student employee, he's eating his lunch. Julian, <laughs> Julian, hello. Hi there. Sorry. <laughs> Not to put him on the spot or anything, but uh, th this is our primary workspace. We do have these tables here. They're on wheels, so they can uh, change the, the layout of the room pretty quickly and easily. Uh, we host classes in here quite frequently, uh, more towards the beginning and the end of the semester, and we'll get into the timing of classes too later. I'd like to. Um, we can fit comfortably maybe 20 students in here at a time. Well, I don't want to say comfortably. They'll fit, <laughs> but comfortably maybe 12 or 15. Okay. Since this is the old surf desk, we do have some offices back here. Uh, I'm gonna show you, this is formerly the resource sharing office. It is now a 3D printer room. So here we go. That's cool. <laughs> Now we are primarily a MakerBot shop. I have my opinions on that, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, there are five MakerBot uh, fifth gens in this space. I'll try to give you a good view of what we have going on. Now it's, we used to have them out in the space proper, and we still have a couple out there and I'll show you, but it's nice to have them kind of tucked away because if you use a 3D printer, they can get noisy especially if you have a lot going all at all hours. So when we had classes in here, it was just distracting. So we shoved away at an office. Uh, there is a, a glass window here so we can easily see the monitor if something's jammed or if there's something flashing that we have to deal with. But it does cut back on the noise a lot. And it's been really nice. So that's this area. And Christian, quick question for you. Sure. Um, with your printers, are you mainly using PLA as your material of choice? I forget if MakerBots can use ABS or anything like that as well. Well, some of the MakerBots can. The fifth gen mm -hmm. can't. So we primarily use PLA, but we yep. do have one of their, uh, we do have a 2X that will print ABS. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have a couple other printers that can, can print ABS, but they're currently in the basement because they, uh, <laughs> they get a little bit of work before they're ready for prime time. Sure. <laughs> Feeling good so far. Questions for me yet? Okay, I'll keep going. We're almost through. You're doing great. 
No one's dizzy yet? <laughs> All right, next office down. This is where we have our, our laser cutter. This is the most expensive piece of equipment we have. We didn't have to buy it. It was a donation. Whoa. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, it's, uh, we, we inherited it from one of the computer science professors who works for another uh, resource on campus called the Center for Innovation. And they have, I think it's almost 33 3D printers, but they're, they're not a makerspace per se. We do have a making program, uh, but they're also meant to be like a money-making wing of the university for small business startups and uh, business incubation, things like that. But uh, I think they got a new etcher, so we got their old one. So I'm not complaining, it's a nice piece of hardware. <laughs> Okay, let's see if I can get it in here. Uh, it's, uh, I'll lean over a little bit. Okay, there's our laser cutter. It's uh, Epilog Mini, uh, 60 watt. Uh, and here's the workstation that it is attached to. And this is a window outside. You can see the academic mall. Maybe it's probably really blown out in the camera, but there it is. <laughs> That's our laser cutter. We can talk more about what we use this for. I just is there a ventilation or do you use the filtration system? That's a very good question. We, we just have a filter built in. Uh, this one doesn't require ventilation, so we didn't have to poke any holes in the wall. Woohoo! I know. Well, it, even if we, if we had to do that, this is an external wall, so it would be pretty easy to do it, but thankfully. Our campus, on our campus, our um, architects don't really want to have things sticking out of our library because of the um, architectural integrity of the building. So they want it to look a certain way. So um, yeah, anyway, enough that about that. Sense. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Okay, what else can I show you? I'm gonna do one more pan over here. You'll see a couple more 3D printers. We do have some in the space proper just because we didn't have room for them elsewhere. And this cabinet down here, that's where we keep most of our filaments. Uh, with desiccant canisters to kind of wick the moisture out of the air and then just roast those periodically to dry them out again. We do have a MakerBot Z18, that's the big one, uh, for you know, larger prints. And I think we inherited this glass shelf from, it might have been the bookstore or one of the shops that uh, was on campus that is no longer with us. So it's a display cabinet for like a retail establishment and it's been great for showing off student work. So this, the site that's facing us is where we keep our 3D prints to be picked up. And we have a few tools here. On the other side, facing out into the library proper, uh, we have a lot of student example work that uh, can be seen as people walk by, hopefully generate interest in what we offer that way. We do have a space downstairs in the basement. It's dark and scary, and I'm not gonna take you down there. But it was the only space we had, so we repurposed it. We do have a sewing machine down there, and uh, we keep all of our Ellison die cuts down there. We have hundreds of them. And uh, we have bigger tables than what we have up here, so it's good for larger uh, projects that might require you know, spreading out cloth or paper or things like that. I, won't, I don't want to scare you today, so I won't take you down the steps, and uh, I honestly don't think our Wi-Fi would hold out down there. <laughs> so that's the space. If you don't mind, I'm going to have a seat and hopefully get situated here. How are we feeling? feeling good? Awesome. So um, can we... I, I have a bunch of questions based on some of the things you shared with us. Like we we don't have I we have like one MakerBot and uh, it it definitely has its limitations. And I know you said you're a MakerBot shop. I hope you don't mind me asking. Can you tell us a little bit about the MakerBot functionality and also your opinions? You mentioned that you had opinions about that, and I was we we deliberately um, didn't purchase them because of uh, proprietary issues and you know being a library. Librarians tend to care about things like that. That tends Absolutely. to be one of our open source is really key and open access is really key for us. So I'm just curious if you could um, talk for a minute while you're sitting down a little bit about the intentionality behind choosing MakerBot. Like, was it intentional? If so, how was there funding provided, donation, partnership, curriculum development, all of that kind of stuff? That's great. Uh, so let me talk a bit about how we're funded first because that speaks directly to your question. 
um, we we acquired our first MakerBot printer, the fifth gen, like as soon as it came out. It was before I even started here at the university, and I've been here two and a half, almost three years now. Um, we received a grant from SWAN, Southwestern Ohio and neighboring libraries. It's our local library consortium. Uh, my manager, the assistant director, applied for a grant, received funding, and purchased a 3D printer with it. Um, MakerBot, it's a big name when you're starting out with 3D printing program. It makes perfect sense to gravitate towards that name. So I'm pretty sure that's how we got that printer. And it's a printer that we still use today. It's still functional. It still works pretty well. So that's how we got that one. Um, the other MakerBots we have, I spoke briefly about the Center for Innovation up the street. Uh, they gave us several of their printers um, because we had the need, and uh, I guess they're, they had more printers than they needed at the time, so we inherited some of those along with their laser cutter. I'm not about to turn a gift away, <laughs> especially when 3D printing has been so popular and we needed more machines. If you, you know, going back to budgets, we didn't have the money to buy nine printers. So that's how we acquired those. But uh, I share your concerns about the proprietary platform that, uh, that MakerBot is. Um, other than that, I don't have too many complaints. Um, they're just not very hackable. And you know, we're tinkerers at heart, so there's not a whole lot we can do with that. Right, we are at the point now where we're at the point now where um, we've been repairing um, everything down to the linear bearings on mm -hmm. our right. wow. yeah. 3D printers. So because they've been in service for so long and they get used so much. So I'm just curious, do you, when you inherited them, did you also inherit, I know a lot of people, I rely heavily on warranties when I purchase them the first year or so, but now we seem to know what we're doing in, in our, our work, we tend to know how to fix everything. So w when something does break, how do you all handle that? That, that responsibility falls on us. So <laughs> we roll, the, roll our sleeves up and get the tools out and the grease and whatever it is we need and we, we do the best that we can with it. Uh, I guess another complaint with MakerBot is the whole extruder thing. Um, so They're MakerBot, disposable, right? They're, they're disposable. <laughs> practically, at least they sell it that way. But it's 200 bucks a pop. Yeah. So if you have a clog, you're out $200. Uh, when you know, a hot end extruder you can get for 20 bucks. So I don't, <laughs> that's a sticking point. Also the filament cost. This is by MakerBot filament directly. It's like $45 a kilogram. And there are vendors that will sell it for $15, $20 a kilogram. So we, we since have switched vendors for filament. That makes sense. Even though we probably avoided any warranty that we had left for doing that. That's okay, right? Does it it's work? Okay. It works great, and we awesome. save hundreds of dollars a year. There you go. <laughs> um, so we were talking a little bit about instruction, and then um, actually let me back up a little bit further. You were talking about how you check out some of the equipment that's back in that back corner. Um, do you use your library uh, regular checkout system? I don't know if, what kind of catalog you have, but how do you check them out? I know you mentioned that the board games are on an honor resource, which mm -hmm. I've never heard that term and I love it and I'm going to adopt <laughs> it and start using that term. Honor resources are things that, you know, we have plenty of here in our library, but I'm just going to start calling them that um, <laughs> because makerspaces are all about trusting the user. It's right. But how do you check out those other items that you were describing? Oh, we, we just use our uh, regular ILS. We use Sierra here, and uh, we just catalog the, the kits that we have and check them out just like anything else. What about the um, other equipment, so like the laser cutters and the 3D printers, do people book time on that, or do they just walk in? It depends. Uh, so 3D printing, well, as you know, it takes a long time. and. Generally, the staff has to manage that process, like the 3D printing queue, just because initially the idea was students would come in, we teach them how to use the printer, and then they would drive the whole process themselves because it's the makerspace, that's what we should do, right? And that was an abysmal failure because if someone started a print and there was a jam, for instance, and then they left, we didn't know who they were, we couldn't get in touch with them, we didn't have their file, we didn't it was bad. So, so 
So we started an internal tracking system. They actually have an order form now where people can submit the 3D print orders and it's managed by staff. We still offer uh, to students and faculty, if they want to learn, we still offer book time so we can walk them through the process. But that's not a requirement. Most people just want to have a gadget that they can take if they are done or if it's something for a project. So that's how we manage the 3D printing. We don't book time unless they want to learn how to drive. Um, the laser cutter, um, time can be booked for that, but it's not required. If it's not used and people just walk in, they can use it. Um, we try to teach people to be as self-sufficient as possible. So the expectation is, we're not a production shop, so we're, you can't say, can you laser cut this thing and you come in and we do it for you. Uh, we will teach you how to do it. And that's a big difference. Um, we occasionally make an exception for faculty, like, hey, I'm doing this project for class, can you do this whatever for me? And you know, we'll make a, an exception there. But um, you don't have to book time for the laser cutter necessarily. If it's open, it can be used. Um, and we show the students how to use it. And then we watch very closely the first couple times they try, because it's very dangerous. <laughs> and we have fire extinguishers everywhere. <laughs> Uh -huh. Oh, look, I see one in the back corner next to your yes. clock. Yes, hey. there's one over there. And uh, when we were in the laser cutter room, there's one on the floor specific to that machine. Okay. You know what? We are lacking that. I'm just going to take note. It's something I should invest in. Fire extinguishers, uh, safety goggles, uh, first aid kit. Uh, what else do we have? Rubber gloves. Um, we have like... Well, like workshop gloves too, because we do some basic woodworking. We have some saws and drills and things. So any kind of protection like that is probably a plus. Um, can you talk a little bit about the instruction that you're doing in this space? So what kinds, uh, you, you mentioned the English class, but what other kinds of classes come in? Do they request with, I don't know if you have a liaison librarian service where you are, how do they request to come into the makerspace? And what, what kinds of instruction are you offering? That's a good question, and the, the kinds of classes we see in here are not what I expected at all. Um, so the expectations definitely changed between when we opened the space and where we all are now, uh, which isn't a bad thing, it's been awesome, but I expected computer science students, physics students maybe, uh, some of the, the hard sciences, they yeah, will 3D print this thing for stress testing, whatever, or science people would do a model for whatever they were working on. That was not the case. We, we get a lot of education majors, we get a lot of sociology, uh, theater uh, for, for props and things like that. Uh, who else do we work with a lot? I guess those are the big ones, but it wasn't what we expected. Uh, but uh, faculty make arrangements with me directly and I um, there's just a list of questions I'll go through with them to figure out what it is they're working on and what we need. So we try to customize for their needs as much as we can. Uh, I have the, kind of what I did when I walked around, I have the canned tour. A lot of faculty members just bring their, their class in and I give the tour and then we have students available to help them as they work through whatever project it is they're working on with our resources. That's one option. And in some cases we customize specifically to the curriculum in that class. Um, whatever that may be, and I'll work with the faculty member directly, do the outline, they'll bring the class in and we'll walk through that, and then provide uh, support after the fact. Is that sufficient? That yeah, makes that makes sense. Okay. We have a lot of sociology majors using our space also, which I think is awesome. It's fascinating. It's, they're doing a lot of like visualization and, and things like that. It's not what I expected. It's great to see that, but it's just not what we expected. <laughs> Um, can you tell us a little bit about why you think it's important to have and retain both the low tech and the high tech? Like, how does that, how does that intersect in terms of user involvement and um, the sewing machine? You mentioned we have sewing machines also. Um, I'm just curious your opinions about the importance of navigating both of those in a makerspace. I mean, part of it's the need. I mean, there are plenty of students who, when they walk in, they don't know exactly what it is they need. They just know that this is a project you've right. been tasked with. Now what? <laughs> so that's why we do staff the space to help students navigate uh, the area and the resources we have. 
but uh, making is a lot more than just high tech. I mean, and there's plenty of places where, where it intersects. Absolutely. Like, uh, you can program a computer to manipulate something physical. You can, a lot of people, okay, our most, case in point, our most popular thing that we have, and I don't even think I showed it to you, is our button maker. Us <laughs> too. I think it's the most popular thing. We go it's, through those buttons like nobody's business. It's crazy. Yeah, we, we order thousands a year. I think we go through two or 3,000 a year. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. And we don't charge for any of our resources yet. And the, with few exceptions, we can talk a bit about pricing later if you want to. But the demand is there. I mean, we, we keep a we keep a drawer full of crayons, and we, and, uh, we have a, a sticker maker, which is a recent acquisition mm. that the students are in love with. It was twenty dollars, and it's 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 the best investment we've made, I think. We are currently investigating ways to do the punch outs for buttons so that people don't have to manually cut them. Do you have a recommendation for the type of uh, button? Do you use a type of button punch? Because the ones that I've been looking at, there's like a very expensive tabletop one where you can see what you're about to punch through. Um, but then the cheap ones, they tend to be, you can't see where you're punching. You just have oh, to kind of okay. guess. So I'm just curious if you have a button puncher or how you do that, it's, especially since you see such high volume. I can tell you right now, I don't see that much. I don't think I see that much volume with um, buttons in our space. We got a lot of traction with like SGA and other student groups too. So they use us to produce their resources. We do have a cutter. Uh, if it's in the eye shot, I will scurry over and grab it for you. One second. I love maker librarians. <laughs> We're so passionate and just like. Okay. Works back. Very good. I um, love it. You have a, an eye line inventory of your space. That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. And stuff moves around. You never really know. Yeah. We try to keep it organized, but it's generally order, you know, order chaos. Um, so we do have this. It's from American Butt Machines. Oh. It's a circular cutter. And there's a metal plate that it sits on, so you're not cutting into whatever is underneath. And you can, there's a hole in it, so you can see basically what you're cutting. Funny thing about this is I didn't know we had this for the longest time. It was like in a box somewhere. So I was handing out scissors to people, like, here, cut out your design and do the best that you can. But then we found this and it made our lives a whole lot easier, for sure. Just as an aside, too, I've used, like, they have circular craft cutters, which mm -hmm. I don't know if they design those to the same dimensions as a button. But those things cut perfect circles. I think Martha Stewart makes one you can buy like Kmart or wherever she has lines, Walmart, oh, yeah. whatever it is. But those things work really well for getting even circular cuts. And they're inexpensive. It's always a plus, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's funny though, but it, it seems like when, when we're buying resources, a lot of what students request are those cheaper kinds of things. For sure. No, I'm just thinking about the space that we're building, like a very high tech space. And that's not even something that I had mentioned, but I'm going to mention it to my coworker who's buying all the equipment. Be like, oh, by the good. way, this is a very popular thing at another space and a low investment, you know, low investment, high return of use. <laughs> right. And it's always what you don't expect. Like, I just think, oh, everyone's going to want a 3D print. That's not the case. No. Or everyone's want a laser cut. A lot of people are intimidated by it yeah. because it's expensive, potentially dangerous equipment. Yeah. And that, and that's, and I'm sure you all have wrestled with this too. Like how can we create a welcoming space for our students or our patrons? That's the and biggest that, question. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think, and I think uh, these lower tech kinds of things are a good way to introduce people to the space. And it's a good way to get people over that hurdle. Like, okay, you made this. Let's add this into the mix, or let's add something a little more technical, or it might take a few extra minutes, but let's try this and then just kind of snowball it from there. We, I refer to those as micro experiences designed for them to gain quick confidence, quick creative confidence, right? Oh, I like that. Exactly. Yes, yesterday, one of our students referred to them as attaboys. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's exactly what they are. That's, that's an good. attaboy. That's good. I like that a lot. <laughs> and, 
and I think a part of what we do to introduce students to what we have, because we have so much and it's really hard to communicate all that we have, but no one wants to go through a list on a website. <laughs> like here's an inventory of what we have, no one cares. So we, we do a variety of events throughout the week to in, promote the various things that we have access to. We call them Make a Mondays. I know it's really original, but we like alliteration as do most libraries, I feel. Uh, and it's just a drop in project that we intentionally make it quick, five to 10 minutes, come in on your lunch break between classes, make a doodad, you're in the makerspace, you know that we have this thing now, and then hopefully you come back for other things. What are the kinds of things you do that are five or 10 minute experiences? Uh, this week we made, what was it, this week or last, we did bumper stickers with the vinyl cutter, uh, just text-based. So uh, you know, a lot of people just wanted Xavier on a bumper sticker, which makes sense. So you cut it out with a vinyl cutter and then you can slap that on your car. Uh, we've done, next week we're doing LED throwies. We've done uh, paper marbling. Uh, we, oh, ceramic coasters were really popular. I didn't expect this either. I got a box of 100 ceramic coasters for like $20 and uh, just white three inch squares. And then I just got out a box of Sharpies and Mod Podge spray. Right? So uh, you just draw your design, you spray it down, and you have a coaster. That's surprisingly uh, amazing. And, and it was so simple, and people loved it. It was crazy popular. I mean, we've, <laughs> we have to buy, we routinely purchase ceramic tiles. I'm taking notes. So if you're hearing me muting and then, and then <laughs> coming back, um, I do believe that my supply list for today for things to order has just um, gotten a little bit larger. We had, we had already been looking at the punch. So I found that um, American button machines circle cutter you referred to, which is currently $90. So, and is available. And I think that's the best. That's the one that we're going to get. So that's something we've been looking at this week. I don't know if anyone else is in that same um, situation it is, but thanks for now. I'm just taking tons of notes on all of this. Not I've never thought to use the vinyl cutter too to do bumper stickers, though. I think at Boise State, some of our folks would probably have issue with um, the branding stuff. So I don't know if you get branding kind of things, kind of questions from people ever. But we, we it, it hasn't come up yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to ignore it for now. I think that's yeah. wise. That's how yeah, it goes. That's, that's sort of a similar thing. I did. Um, <laughs> A, I just 3D printed a ton of our pan. We have our panther as our mascot, and so I 3D printed a whole bunch in orange because I had orange ABS lying around that no one else was going to use. And I didn't get asked about it yet, so <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'm great. like, oh, just going to keep doing that kind of thing until <laughs> something. Um, Can you talk about your space staffing? I think we haven't covered the staffing part yet. Oh, we haven't talked about staffing. You're right. Uh, so. Uh, I manage the space, but the makerspace is technically only a quarter of my job description. Uh, it feels more than that a lot of times, <laughs> but you know, we're a small private school. We all wear many hats, but I think that's across the board. I'm sure you all do different things at your institutions too. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I manage the space and I, we have nine student employees now, uh, part of our work study program. So that's how their salary is funded as part of their uh, financial aid package. So nine student employees uh, part time and they are mostly all comfortable with the resources we have and they just staff the space. They also help work uh, re workshops and things. They are available when classes come in. And we do occasionally go on the road too. Like we have a local maker fair that's hosted by the uh, Cincinnati Museum Center that we are present at. We go to some high school and grade school events too. So it's not just, we get out in the community, it's not just self contained in this little 300 square foot room or however many square feet we have. Are, what, what are your hours of operation? Do you have, um, are you open when the library is open or is it narrower than that? That's a good, that's a good question. And it's, it's both. And let me explain what I mean by that. So uh, we are staffed by students Monday through Friday from 10 to 5 through this academic uh, year, or at least the semesters. Um, however, we do have card swipe access, so students can ask for um, access after hours, whenever the library is open. 
So if they want to come in and work on a project on weekends, they can do that. They just have to prove to us that they won't burn the place down when they get here. Yeah. Do you run them through a training protocol for that? It's, it's a simple checklist. It's not really formalized. I just meet with them and say, what would you do in this situation? And if they I say, love that. Grab that's, the fire extinguisher. <laughs> that's great. And uh, oh, we also have a phone in the space. We, that's probably important, too, with uh, the campus police on speed dial if something goes wrong. Uh, so we do have that. But uh, that's how we handle staffing. And then what kinds of folks visit your space? Do you, I don't know if you're, some spaces, for example, University of Nevada, Reno, they're open to the community because they are a land grant institution, your small private um, liberal arts college. So I imagine you're not, you don't have that same um, imperative, but do you have community members, students, staff, faculty, what, who's coming in to use your space? All of the above, it's, it's primarily students. Uh, although there are some faculty power users who I work with quite frequently. We have the handful who I see you know, every week. Uh, but we do have community members come in as well, and we're open to that. Uh, I mean, technically, we could be close to the community, but we, we don't. that's not how we do things around here. So we welcome, we welcome anyone who wants to walk in. Uh, it might have an impact on pricing, like if we charge for resources. But if we do that, it's always at cost. We're not trying to gouge anybody. Um, but we try to make as much as we can free. For newbies starting out who haven't yet started doing a makerspace um, or who are just in the beginning stages of putting their makerspace together, you've been around for two years. Um, what advice would you give? Let's say, let's, what advice would you give to yourself two years ago? What would, what would you say? <laughs> what, would, what would I say to myself two years ago? Um, so your makerspace will evolve and it's not going to be what you expect it to be from mm. the beginning. Yep. And, and that's okay. That's not a problem necessarily. It's okay to start small and, and you, it can be done with a limited budget as I'm sure we all have encountered. I mean, I wish I was rolling in money right now because my wish list is constantly growing. <laughs> right, right. But I, only have, I only have so many dollars I can spend a year, so I have to be really selective, which I think is another reason the, the low-tech kinds of things are so popular because they're cheaper. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to offer that something I've realized is that if I develop, if I develop quotes and I develop proposals for things that, um, if I just keep those kind of lying around and I just share them periodically without any expectation that anyone's going to ever give me funding, eventually those things do actually get funded. And the more prepared I am by having quotes on deck, um, having quotes literally in my back pocket, like, yeah, I'm ready, here you go. Um, I've found that there are people that have come out of the woodwork and said, yeah, I'm willing to fund that. Here's money for it. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, thank God I did all that legwork. Um, right. In one example, I know that at Plymouth, Erica has told me that they already have the one button studio. And that was one thing that worked out for us here is I developed with a small team, a group, um, basically a proposal to create a multimedia studio and the funding for that uh, did eventually appear, right? And so I guess um, being eternally optimistic is one of the characteristics of maker librarians, right? Is oh, for sure. we're constantly being thrown into these situations where the learning curve is fairly steep, but that mm -hmm. optimism can carry us through. And so I, I would, I just wanna offer for anybody that's watching this that please, if you're new at the maker space, don't hesitate to just, keep thinking big because eventually it it is going to work out and i guess i'm curious what kind of legwork you all did christian at xavier before you opened your space two years ago um was there anything that you did prior to that i know you you said you just started two and a half to three years ago so what had you done if anything that you started dipping your toe in the water before opening the space or was the space already in the works before you got there the the ideas were in the works before i got here uh, we, we already had a 3D printing program, uh, as small as it was, and that had uh, gained popularity and traction. But really, we just took a plunge, pretty much. I mean, sure, we, we had informal surveys, like, would you like this? And everyone, of course, says, well, okay, yeah, I think so. <laughs> yes, of course I want this. <laughs> of course we want this. <laughs> so, we just, so we just did it. And, and it, has, it has worked out 
better than expected, I would say. Do you have any specific types of assessment that you count in terms of like how, do you, how you say it's successful? Because that's something that I know all maker spaces have struggled with is um, how do we how do we say this is this is awesome. Like I know we have stories and I use a lot of stories and that's mm -hmm. something that I used a lot at the beginning. But is there anything else that you count or a metric that you pay attention to that you're willing to share with us? Well, I know how much libraries appreciate numbers. Uh, there are some numbers that we can track, but a lot of it is just the stuff that gives us the warm and fuzzies that we kind of have to keep track of. Uh, we, we do count the number of 3D print orders we get. So that's an actual metric that we can point to, and that has grown every semester since we, since we opened. So I think that's telling. Uh, we can also track how many classes we have in here. Um, and we do, we track that how many classes, how many students that we've served. Uh, one metric I point to quite frequently, I, I think it was last, last spring, so a year ago, uh, the makerspace, we served more students than the reference desk did during that time. And I don't- Okay, that's wild. <laughs> right? That's wild, yeah. And I mean, that's, that's fantastic for us. Yeah. And, but on the flip side, what does that say about our reference services? Right, yes, <laughs> so, yeah. So we're definitely I, caught in the in-between space right now where we're like, well, we are trained librarians. We do love books, but I can't help it. This is popular. I happen to be here. And so there's a lot of that tornness going on in libraries right now, right? Exactly. Definitely. We don't know where we are and we're in this huge period of transition change and people have, have to kind of change their um, skill sets, right? Oh, absolutely. Dif it's difficult for some of us, I think. And some are resistant. I, I know, I'm sure you all work with people who look at the makerspace and just discount it as just a flash in the pan kind of whatever. Totally. Yeah. But it's not. It's not. It's exactly. not. And what's fascinating to me is like what I've basically done in the past year is said that everyone who, like we all have liaison areas here. And so as I'm chemistry, right? And so I, it doesn't necessarily make sense for me to always be doing other people's liaison area instructions. So as those instruction sessions requests come in, it goes both to me and to that liaison librarian um, and they're taking the lead. So they're, um, this past week, in fact, we did art instruction, material science instruction and geosciences instruction. And the liaisons essentially led setting those up and I just helped as much as I possibly could. So. That took a while to get to, but that's a model that's starting to work. Cross your fingers for me. So I offer that to you all. Oh, that's way to wonderful. Get more involvement. I, I wish we were there ourselves. I, I'm the sciences liaison, uh, but I also do a majority of the makerspace instruction for everybody else. <laughs> so we're not quite to that point yet, but I, I'm happy to hear that it's been working for you and hopefully we can make some progress. It, it's a recent development and I'm happy to <laughs> chat, Christian, anytime about how we were able to kind of make that change. I, awesome. I'm not gonna say that it was the um, easiest or best transition. Um, and I don't know how many friends I made in the process, but that's okay. Well, it's okay, it's okay. Right. We're all good now. Everything's good at the time, so. Good. Erica, do you have any other questions that you want to jump in and ask? Yeah, I just, I'm going back to sort of the maker side of things. I saw that you have PLA and it sounds like you have vinyl for the vinyl cutter. Uh, are there any other materials that you provide and, and tiles? <laughs> um, and we saw sort of the selection of craft oriented materials at the beginning and checkout stuff. But I was wondering if there's any materials you provide in particular departments provide for things like the laser cutter uh, woodworking, sewing, things along those lines? Oh yeah, that's a great question. What else do we provide? We do provide wood for the laser cutter. It's foot square, eighth inch plywood boards. It's pretty inexpensive. We get it on Amazon and we order a few, we order a few boxes. Uh, there's someone trying to get my attention and uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, and we order a few boxes, um, a semester probably and that's sufficient we don't charge for that um we do provide the buttons the filaments mm -hmm. all the other consumables those are included in our budget the only thing we really charge for is if someone wants to buy or make a lot of buttons like if a student club says well, yeah. i want 300 buttons okay <laughs> we got to figure out a pricing structure we usually charge yeah. like 10 cents a button or something okay. like that. uh with 3d prints uh 
Okay, let's talk about this, the pricing structure for 3D yeah. prints because um, we've had to adjust it a little bit. Um, 3D printing for classes, we've made it completely free for anything. And we, because we want it to be free for students to fail. We, we, we don't want price to be a hindrance and they're, they're tweaking a design or trying something a bit differently. Mm -hmm. So 3D printing for classwork is free. Uh, personal prints are also free to a certain point. We capped it at 75 grams, so seven, eight hour print roughly. Anything above that we do charge at 10 cents a gram and that's just to recover some of the cost and it's yeah. also to discourage people from clogging up our printers. <laughs> uh-huh. Have you seen that as a problem in the past? People clogging up <laughs> machines or, or do you get the sort of soup because you have less of a, a structure around machine usage, do you see sort of repeat offenders <laughs> or, or or makers in a good way that come in and sort of use the equipment a lot? Is it and are those, I, I'm going to make this a two-part question, uh, <laughs> sure. and those folks that come in, are they doing larger projects? And third part to that, is there student storage for projects, or how do you deal with that? Because I saw you have your storage shelving, but that is something, we're, we're in the process of, we have, I have 3D printers that I work with, we're mm -hmm. in the process of building a space outside of our library, um, so I'm just curious about student storage in particular because that seems to be a, a point of information that varies a lot at the different institutions I've been to. Oh, sure. Let me start with that because I yeah. think that's going to be the easiest answer. Yeah. So, whatever storage we have is very informal. We do have yeah. that glass shelf. We do mm -hmm. have some storage space. We have a closet that we can use if we need to. Mm -hmm. It's not secured. Uh -huh. I don't think we've had anything walk out. Yeah, but <laughs> you never know. But we do offer a shelf. It's like a foot square glass cube that okay. students can slap their name on and throw a project mm -hmm. in. Cool. Uh, for the bigger projects, we just throw it up on a shelf and hope that it's there when they get back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't really have a, a formalized method. Mm -hmm. We don't have lockers or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And the other part to the question was the the question about sort of. Uh, usage, I always, I always frame it in a, in like a fairness idea that do you get the same, uh, same folks in a lot? Do you get a variety of people and particularly individual users is what I'm really thinking about. Oh, yes. Thank you for oh. reminding me. Because yeah. And then I was thinking too about um, policies in regards to that. Say if you have a student coming in who's making a lot of things and saying, oh, I want to sell this thing on Etsy. Are, do you have any policies in place in regards to making and sort of making financial gain from said making? That's a good question too. Mm -hmm. We do have a policy for that now because yeah. we ran into that. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> we have we two had, already and we just have 3D printers. Yeah, we had a very ambitious student. I mean, and kudos to the student because it was a great idea. Yeah. Just came in after hours and he, he was allowed to and started printing a lot of things. Yeah. And then I asked him about it. What are you printing this for? Oh, oh I, I, I sell them to other students. Oh. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Which is fine, but because of that, we did have to implement a charge. So I mentioned for personal work, it's 10 cents a gram yep. over, every, over 75. Yep. If it's for a business purpose, we charge 10 cents a gram for the whole thing mm -hmm. because of that. Hmm. So we did implement that policy just because of patron behavior and it's been fine we, mm -hmm. we honestly haven't run into it that frequently mm -hmm. Interesting. And, yeah. and we, do, we do have our power users for sure uh, we have a handful of students who will print every week wow. probably right uh, and then we also have our class-based slew of orders that will happen so we'll have mm -hmm. a uh, we worked very closely with an occupational therapy class last semester and they had huge group projects that they had to print all at once so I blocked off all of our printers for a week just for that class, just mm -hmm. to get them done. Yep. So it's, it sounds like you've run into similar kinds of things. Yeah, well, it's, it's uh, we don't have, so our, right now I just have printers and it's a service point kind of concept until we get our space. Um, because within our library, they're just, there's a lot of arguments about space and for sort of, I work in IT. 
I came from a public library though, so I'm sort of aligned with a library perspective in a lot of ways. Um, but there's a lot of ideas about space and space ownership and how the library is going to provide services and all those fun things when we're sort of half IT, half librarians. Um, and our whole university is changing leadership models and things. But in regards to the printing, we have one class that comes in and we it's during the end of the semester, which I also run a print shop, like large format and all that fun stuff. And it gets extremely busy. But once we move to our space, that kind of information is valuable because we'll have that same course coming in and doing their 3D scan models. And we'll have to think about how to set aside that time on the printers because our printers are moving to our maker space um, for that particular class, knowing that we're going to be doing, I don't know, it's probably 200 to 300 plus hours of printing for that one class because we're printing little busts of every every person in that class oh wow oh my gosh <laughs> yeah that's wild it's 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 a cool project we have our uh, uh some sculptors and in our arts program and the, that's been the early adopter of 3d printing has been our arts department more so than anyone else just interesting because i figured it might be some some other department that would be the the folks doing like buying into all of this but our arts department has been huge um i have another question for you christian i know we're about to hit about an hour but um i was curious about the pro like the location of your library on campus um and if that impacts the kind of populations that you see coming into your space so it always seems like the different institutions that I've met and talked with through these these forums and through visiting spaces. Everything seems to be impacted by physical location. So I was wondering if that had any impact on your space and who comes to visit. That's a good point, and I, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I, mm -hmm. We're we're mostly centrally located. Like we, the library is right on the academic wall, mm -hmm. uh, which is the the oldest portion of the campus. I mean, these buildings have been here a hundred years. Uh, not the library building I'm in, we're 50 years old now. Um, mm -hmm. And I think our biggest classroom building is Alter Hall, and it's right next door to where we are. Wow. So there's definitely a lot of activity here. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, the campus has it grown and expanded over the years, so we're not necessarily right in the middle. I mean, the, the, the student center is a bit of a walk. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the cafeteria is a bit of a walk. Uh, student housing is a, a bit of a way. But I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I mean, we're okay. pretty central and we get a lot of traffic and people, mm -hmm. a lot of people just walk into the library this way because it's the easiest way to get into the building. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know if that impacts our traffic or not. That's an interesting question that I'll have to investigate further though. Yeah, cool. Can I refer to my list to make sure I talked about everything I wanted to? Go yeah. for it. All right, we talked funding, staffing, so on. Programming. Oh, one, okay, one thing I will mention, and it may or may not be helpful, is um, the timing of when I bring classes into the space. And, and this is a lesson that I learned pretty early on. I think it was the fall after we opened, and it was a sociology class, because they've been pretty, pretty heavy users of the space. So, I worked with that faculty member, we brought a class in, the first or second week of class, gave them the tour, and um, it was a mess. It was a mess, because the timing was poor. So what we did, because what happened was the students saw the resources that we had, but it happened before they figured out what their projects were going to be. Mm. So they were trying to cram their project into something that didn't necessarily make any sense in context. Gotcha. That makes sense. So the next semester, same faculty member, same class, different batch of students, we brought them in much later in the semester, maybe a couple weeks before their project was due. So they already developed what their project was. And then they saw the resources that they could fit their project to. So it was exactly the opposite workflow as to what was a flop the previous semester. So when I work with faculty, I remind them of the whole timing issue. Some faculty members just want to give their students a tour. If that's the case, they can do that anytime. Mm -hmm. But if it's with a specific project, it's important mm -hmm. that those cooperating faculty understand that 
the students have to have an idea of what they're doing before they come to see us. Same as their bibli um, bibliographic instruction, right? We've learned exactly. That. exactly. That's interesting. We had to figure out the right spot, the right timing with making instruction. I, I get it. Well, thanks, Christian. Of I've course, this has been great. So much in this past hour. Yeah. I just want to say thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you all for having me. This has been a lot of fun. And I'm, of course, available if anything comes up after the fact. I'm pretty easy to get in touch with. And are you cool. okay with us posting a YouTube link to this on the website and sharing it with folks? Oh, yeah, of course. Not a problem at all. I don't, I don't think I said anything inappropriate, did I? I'll leave no. that to you. Gotcha. No. <laughs> <laughs> no.